So I've been shooting film for over 10 years now and I've used a lot of film cameras, but I have a few that I go back to regularly and pick up and use. And surprisingly, they're all quite affordable. I thought this would be worth sharing with you guys as film prices are going up and I know there are a lot of newbies out there wanting to try film photography, but they're not ready to drop those big bucks just yet. So let's have a look at what I own, what I use regularly, what I get great results with and what I recommend to you if you're on a budget. That was so full camera guy. <laughs> so let's start where it all began. When I first started shooting film over 10 years ago, I was using these two cameras, the Nikomat EL and then this Fujika. They both were very unreliable with light leaks, broken electronics, foggy viewfinders, and just all around quite difficult to use for a beginner. I didn't get very consistent results with these cameras and I'd often get blank rolls or my photos would be really underexposed and I wasn't sure what was going on. To add to that, they were extremely heavy and chunky to carry around on a photo walk. And whilst I liked the look of them, I was always kind of hating how heavy they were. So safe to say, I just wasn't really having the best time with these two cameras, um, despite them being like the typical kind of vintage film camera that I thought I should be using. So not long after the Nikon and the Fujika, my mom, God bless her, bought me this Nikon F80 in a thrift store in a bag with all the accessories. I think it had another lens, um, heaps of filters, like stuff to clean it with, like all this stuff that I never really used. And I was really stoked to be trying out a new film camera that looked a lot more modern than these ones. After the manual hot mess of the other two cameras that I was using, I was so happy to be able to just put this on auto and shoot and actually get photos that were exposed properly, actually get photos like on my negatives, which very often I would drop it off at the lab and it would turn out that like the film hadn't even advanced or something had just gone wrong every time. So whilst I was having a better time with the Nikon F80, I was kind of really overwhelmed with all of the buttons. Even looking at it now, 10 years later, I still kind of feel like that. It kind of looks like a digital camera and that scares me because I only really know how to use like a simple film camera. So often I would bump something and it would go into some like weird mode and then all these things would happen and I would have no idea how to fix it. Probably could have been solved by reading the manual, but that's just not something that I do. Just to add to the graveyard of cameras, um, this camera now has a broken battery door and there's something kind of clinging around in there so not sounding too good but um this was the camera that I used for a very very long time and whilst it wasn't perfect it was good for me I think my main issue with it was that it just didn't look very cool and it yeah it looks like a digital camera and I really liked the idea of shooting film and I wanted people to know that I was shooting film so using this camera it didn't have the same kind of feel as the Nikomat and the Fujika, but I very quickly enjoyed this more because I actually got photos and I think my photography got better when I started using this camera. So whilst there's nothing wrong with these ones, they're not the ones that I would recommend. The ones that I would recommend, we're gonna get into now. I just thought I would share the story of how I got started and the cameras that I got started with. Okay, so the Nikon F 60 and f65 there's heaps of iterations of this in canon like the canon rebel g um, even some of the eos you can get a pentax version minolta dynax any of those kind of 90s plastic slr cameras i thought these cameras were pretty much the same as the f80 but they're a lot more stripped down they don't have as many buttons and they're a bit lighter too which is really awesome these cameras have something called modes which make it such a breeze to shoot. You can just pop it in portrait or landscape, sports mode, all those things. I actually have a whole video on using modes in your photography and how much that can help you. So I will link that below if you're interested in checking it out. So this is my first recommendation. If you are like truly, truly on a budget, you can pick these up really cheap. I would say they're probably like the last bargain in film photography. They don't really have much charm. Uh, like I said, they kind of just look like digital cameras, which is fine. Like you're still going to get really good results with them, but you're not going to get that kind of like film shooting experience of like advancing the lever or like loading the film. Everything's kind of automatic and like you're pressing buttons. It was kind of when we were like moving over to 
digital. So you're not going to get any cool like artsy film shooting points for using these cameras, but you will get really, really good photos. They are just so reliable, so consistent, and I think you can really hone your photography skills with a camera like this more so than trying to battle through like the constant issues that at least I have had with those like older SLRs. So I think it's a great beginner camera. Um, it's something I would recommend as a beginner camera over like K1000 or like a Canon A1 or any of those sort of cameras that people always seem to recommend. I mean, they're still fine. And if you really want to learn like the exposure triangle and like learn how to shoot manual or do it right, then you probably should use one of those cameras. But I just think these are a great way to just test out if you actually want to be shooting film or not. The benefit of even just adding one of these to your collection to shoot with is the matrix metering system inside is just so sophisticated. So if I'm shooting something like Portrait 800 or 400 or a film stock that is particularly expensive, I would put it in here because I know that like I'm going to get good results and like probably nothing is going to go wrong. Um, same with slide film as well. Um, I've only shot slide film once and I shot it in one of these cameras and it came out really well. And I know that you have to be a little bit more on point with your exposures with slide film. So I know if I shot it in the future, I definitely want to use this camera to have that like little kind of security blanket. The pros just keep coming with these cameras. You can also use all of your digital lenses from like, say if you're a Nikon shooter and you have a collection of Nikon lenses, you can pop them on these. Same if, if you were a Canon shooter. Um, sometimes the autofocus won't work or be compatible with these cameras, but that doesn't really bother me. I like kind of manually focusing and having everything else in auto. Um, so yeah, that's another pro that you won't get with the older cameras. We all know that film cameras are rising in prices and even things that used to be cheap, like a Canon E1 or a Pentax K1000 on eBay or even in thrift stores are rising in prices. And the only thing that kind of isn't rising in prices are these plastic guys. So you can still pick them up really cheap. They're dime a dozen and people are like total shallow snobs and they don't want them. So I guarantee you, you'll be able to find one on Marketplace or Craigslist or eBay or even just a neighbor might have one like in their like garage or something. I'm pretty sure you could get one for under $100. I got this um, Nikon F65 in a box like brand new for $20 on eBay, which is crazy good. I have a bunch of videos of me shooting with the F60 um, and the F80 on the channel. So I will link those below as well if you wanna see these this camera in action. Um, it's definitely my workhorse. I would be pretty happy if I just had this camera for the rest of my life. Next, we're gonna get into a point and shoot that I would recommend. But before we do that, a quick word from today's sponsor, Skillshare. So you've probably heard of Skillshare, the online learning platform, but did you know that Kyle McDougall, the photographer and filmmaker, has two film photography courses on Skillshare? I've been really enjoying getting back to basics with Kyle McDougall's 40 minute course titled Shoot Your First Roll of 35mm Film. If you've watched Kyle on his YouTube channel, then you will know how clear, succinct and generous he is with his knowledge and this course is no exception starting right from where to buy or find your first film camera, what film stock to choose and how to load it, metering tips, where to get your film developed and scanning and editing your photos, Kyle takes you through the whole process. And this is an extremely comprehensive guide for beginners, dabblers, or to be honest, anyone who just loves photography and Kyle McDougall. I've started so many other courses on Skillshare and it's been a great resource for me to learn new skills, level up and stay focused on this ad-free platform. They have thousands of courses across all genres and new courses added each week. So there's so much for you to learn. If you want to check out Kyle's courses on film photography or anything else that you're wanting to explore, then you are in luck. I'm excited to tell you that Skillshare are offering you an entire free month. Just follow these instructions. The first 1000 people to use the link or my code Lucy Lumens Analog Adventures will get a one month free trial of Skillshare Premium. I have pinned that comment and it's in the description box below so you guys can click on that one and you can start exploring your creativity. Back to the point and shoots. So we all know that point and shoot compact cameras are going for an arm and a leg online these days and I really can't justify spending more than a few hundred dollars on one unless you have a particular reason or you're just really flush with money. 
I see a lot of videos recommending point and shoot cameras and what some people call budget, I definitely wouldn't. So I'm hoping I can offer you a few options that are actually affordable. This Canon Sure Shot 76 zoom is my go-to like daily carry point and shoot camera. It's never miss focus. It's really sharp. Um, it has a zoom lens, which is really handy. It's got a built-in flash. So it just has everything you need. Regular viewers of the channel are probably scratching their heads thinking, hmm, I thought she would be recommending the Nikon L35 AF, but that camera has some major issues or quirks, shall we say. So I wouldn't be recommending it to somebody who is on a budget because they're pretty expensive now, especially when they're likely to break or who is beginning in film because it is quite a clunky camera and I have to like masking tape mine up to like get it working and just the buttons and the way that it functions, like the build quality isn't as good as something like this. It's like really sleek, really easy to load, really easy to use and just feels really beginner friendly. I do find those sort of boxy 80s point and shoots a little bit harder to use and navigate than like these 90s style ones. So I wouldn't be recommending the L35 AF, but if you can find one like King Jape style in a thrift store, 100% absolutely grab it. And it is my favorite point and shoot camera. The lens is mwah, but I would definitely not consider it a budget option. So going for something like this might suit you better. I managed to grab mine for $5 on Facebook Marketplace in a bundle with a bunch of other cameras. I was really quick onto that listing and managed to grab it, but I'm sure in places like the US, I'm sure people would 100% have one of these like in their like garage or in their attic, just like sitting there. Maybe people are still giving them away to Goodwill, stuff like that. So keep an eye out in thrift stores. And if you see this, definitely grab it. There's quite a few different iterations of the sure shot, actually like so many. Um, I have a few other ones, but this one's definitely my favorite. I did a little bit of research and buying one of these on eBay it can be anywhere from $89 to $250. Really depends like where you are in the world. Here in Australia, it's a lot more expensive to buy film cameras than it is kind of in America or Europe or England. So yeah, if you jump on eBay, have a look. I think it really depends on how much you're willing to spend, what you feel comfortable buying, who you feel comfortable buying from, if it's been tested, all of those sorts of things. I would consider it a budget option. It's never going to get up to those kind of like T4, T2 prices. So you should be able to still find one for a reasonable price. So you're obviously going to get better image quality from something like the Nikon F60. So that's another decision for you to make of like, do you want to go the SLR route and have like better photos or do you want to have fun with point and shoot? In saying that though, I get really great results from this and I've even sold prints that I've taken on this camera. So I've always been really happy with it. Maybe that's just my experience, but I think you can make really amazing work with a point and shoot. So honorable mention has to go out to the Pentax SBO, uh, sometimes known as the IQ Zoom. I have had really good luck with this camera and always get like really good results. And I would definitely recommend it if you're on a budget. It's probably going to be cheaper than the Sure Shot, like under a hundred dollars. And I see them around all the time in like charity shops and online. The world of point and shoots is just massive and everybody's going to have an opinion on like what is the best one. And there are so many. So it's funny that we just seem to always be hearing about the same kind of four or five that are really expensive. I don't have time to go into like every single point and shoot that I own because that's quite a few. And I still find more and more every week that I've never heard of before. If you are in the market for a particular point and shoot and you have questions, please DM me or comment below and let me know. You can also check out Matt Murray's YouTube channel. He reviews quite a few point and shoots that are kind of like cool and quirky that you've maybe never heard of before. And he is a point and shoot lover and a great resource for anybody wanting to buy cameras online. And he's super friendly. All right, so finally on my list is a very special camera that I kind of feel really professional when I'm using, even though it's not a professional camera at all, is the Olympus OM-10. It is so beautiful and I just love even just holding it. Like I just feel really close to this camera. So the OM-10 is one of the cheaper cameras in the OM system range from Olympus and it's more of a consumer sort of camera compared to the other ones. It does have a bit of a bad reputation for the electronics failing, 
but so far I've had really good luck with it. This camera is my go-to if I want to use like a vintage SLR, which to be completely honest with you, isn't really super often. I will more likely reach for a point and shoot or for my F60, but I am loving this more and more and more as I use it. The combination of the camera and this Zuko, Zuiko 50mm lens is just really beautiful and has a lot of character to it that I don't really get when I use the point and shoot or like the F60. So this is the cheapest way to get into the OM system and it's really, really easy to use. I always just chuck it in aperture priority and it's a total breeze. Apparently these cameras were marketed at women back in the 80s, <laughs> back in the 80s and I kind of I really represent that very sort of outdated view of uh, women that men have created where like, you know, women need things to be easy and they need to shoot like on auto. I am like that. That is a huge generalization. There are a lot of women who aren't like that, but I'm really living up to that and loving the OM-10. <laughs> but for all you manual shooters, both men and women, you can get a little uh, manual adapter, which we have, which I've never used because I love auto. Um, but yeah, it's cool. We just put it on there because then it has somewhere to live. Like I said, the combination of this lens and this camera, these Zuiko lenses are just like so beautiful and legendary. I recently shot a roll of Cinestill 400D. I have a video if you haven't seen it, I will um, link that below. And I've added all of those shots to my print shop. So please check that out and have a look. I'm really proud of those photos and the way the colors came out. And yeah, just this camera just came through on that roll for me. Whilst this is like a vintage metal SLR, like the Fujika and the Nikomat, it is so much lighter. Like it's really, really easy to carry around. I barely notice it's there. Um, and then with this like little 50 millimeter lens, it's just such a good combo to like carry around and walk around all day with. So that's another plus. And I think good for a beginner because You've got so much going on and you don't really want to like have to worry about like lugging this thing around or anything that's going to put you off shooting. So these can be found for under $200 if you're willing to like hunt around and you don't need something straight away. We were lucky enough to get this for $40 on Marketplace, which is a total steal. Just needed a clean and some fresh batteries, which a lot of film cameras, that's all they really need to get going. So if you wanted to pick something like this up, it could be a good idea to hunt around. If you don't know much about film cameras, there are plenty of people in the film community that you could consult and with a little knowledge from them and a little bit of, like I said, clean or batteries, you could find one for under $100. With these old SLRs, especially if they've been left for a long time and you're buying it from somebody who maybe is selling it from a family member or they don't really know anything about cameras, you may find that it has light leaks when you use it. Like I was saying when I first started shooting with old SLRs, that was the case with this one, but we got a pre-cut like light seal kit online and it's a bit fiddly to do. I didn't do it, my partner did it for me, but it's an easy fix and you could probably learn on YouTube, but I'm sure if you asked somebody in the film community, even if you were speaking to them for the first time, I'm sure that they would help you or maybe do it for you in like a camera store or something like that. People are always willing to help. A great way of explaining how much I love this camera would be that if it broke, I would definitely buy another one for like full price. You know, you know those cameras you buy and you, you got it for $40 or you got it for $5 and you love it, so you tell everyone to buy it, but then if you had to buy it for full price, would you really buy it? And the answer is yes, I 100% would. So something that I would not recommend to a beginner, and I'm not sure if the audience will agree with this or not, but that's a rangefinder. So I have two of these Yashica Ministers and way back in the day when I was buying up film cameras because I thought they were just all the same and they were fun and they all looked like cool and which they do and like, you know, even if they end up on your shelf, they're nice things to have. I also had a Yashica Electro 35 GSM, I think that's what it's called. And I used that, I was like really determined. I was like reading about rangefinders. Little did I know the rangefinder range patch needed to be like recalibrated and... <laughs> I'm feeling a bit overloaded with information. That's exactly why. Okay, okay maybe we'll do this. <laughs> My partner just tried to explain more things about rangefinders to me and I am ever more confused and hating them even more than when I started talking about them five minutes ago. <laughs> uh, I just find them really difficult to use. 
Uh, there's just so many things that can go wrong. And with film being so expensive, I just, I hate when you run a roll through and then, you know, you only get like a few photos in focus or it was a really good photo, but it's out of focus because you couldn't get the patch to line up or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, seriously, so you probably will see these and they'll be a good price and you'll think, oh, hey, I can get started with that, which you can. And if you want to learn or you want to go down the range finder path, then that's great. But very often the lens cap will have been left off of these and they have selenium uh, light meters. So if that's been exposed to light, then the light meter won't work. So you really need to keep the lens cap on. There's just a whole host of problems in my eyes really to these. And I just find them difficult to understand and to use. And if you're also trying to find your style or figure out what you want to take photos of or get your head around film stocks and afford film and find time to go out and shoot, it's just like, oh my God, no, thank you. I don't need you, rangefinder. <laughs> <laughs> a quick word on brands as well, because that is something that comes up when people are wanting to buy a camera and we're all devoted to certain brands of certain things in all areas of our life. And it's known here on the channel that I am not a huge Leica fan mainly just because of the kind of snobbery that sometimes goes with it. But my partner recently got this camera and it's obviously very good and there's nothing wrong with Leica, obviously. And, you know, if you're a Leica shooter, it's all just a bit of fun. But I just think it's worth mentioning that we don't need to have a certain brand of camera to take a good photo. And it's something that's said a lot in the film community and in the, you know, digital world as well. And you see a lot of videos on it but I am really trying to show people that rather than just make a video saying, you don't need this camera or you don't need this camera, but then be using that camera. Um, I really endorse things like the Nikon F60 that are actually cheap, accessible and available to people and will get people into film. So I really want to lower that barrier, kind of take away the whole like, you need a Contax T2 or people sitting there like lusting after these cameras that are really out of reach like financially to a lot of us, especially in film, I would rather spend the money on buying more film um, and getting it developed because that's what it's all about, you know, unless you're a, a collector, which is like also fine. But yeah, just don't get caught up in like buying the camera that somebody else has, whether it's somebody you follow on Instagram or it's a professional photographer or it's Kylie Jenner or whatever her name is. Yeah, so just don't get caught up on brands, you know? But let's talk about my new camera. <laughs> the Yashica T4. Okay, so you're cursing me right now. Like you hate me so much. And if I was watching, I would be like, oh my God, I'd be in the comments already. So I didn't buy this camera. I would not buy this camera for multiple reasons. One of them being, I cannot afford this camera. And if you watched the recent episode of the Analog Hour, my new show with Matt Murray, like a talk show, you will have heard the story. Um, a very kind gentleman sent me this from Germany. And thank you so much if you are watching. He sent me this and he sent me a bunch of film and I am still shocked uh, that I own this camera. Um, I wrote a short story for Cosmo Photo about how much I wanted this camera when I was like, 21 when it was way cheaper but it was still too expensive for me and that's how I came to own the L35 AF because that was the you know sort of cheaper version of a T4 then and then now that's really expensive so so many stories here with all the cameras but I cannot believe that I own a T4 I have a roll of film in it now just some Ultramax and I've shot 12 frames um I've been working through it very slowly but I I'm excited to see the photos and it's just so funny to hold something like this. Like it's really small and like kind of dinky and to think that it's like over a thousand dollars in like, you know, comparison to my, I can't find it. Comparing it to the short shot 76. I mean, obviously the glass is not as good. Um, you know, you know, it's, it's not as compact, like for sure, totally, but you know, versus like the price of these two things and then like the t2 like you know i guess i guess we'll see when i get them developed but i just i really don't think that we need this to be making like good photos at all or a person that owns this is making better photos taking better photos 
than the person that owns this. I really do think it's about you. And yeah, I feel really kind of funny like owning this because it's got so much weight to it because of the price. But you know, um, who's to say that it couldn't have been like this camera, you know, like a lot of it was sort of who was using it and who was endorsing it and who was behind it. So yeah, just um, wanted to share with you because it's really exciting that I have this camera. But um, also just a reminder that, you know, I've been loving shooting film for so long without this or any other kind of like high end sort of expensive camera. But enough from me. I want to hear from you guys. What do you think is the perfect 35 millimeter beginner film camera or an affordable beginner film camera or just an affordable camera? Because we all know that they're going up and up in price. So drop it in the comments below. Hopefully this video can be somewhere where people can come and then they can like look through and read the comments and see what everybody else thinks is a good buy. If you love film photography, I also have a podcast, Lucy Lumen's podcast adventure, where I interview fellow film photographers from around the world and we chat about a little bit of photography, but also just other stuff like music and what gets us inspired and keeps us creative. So I will link to that below in the description, check it out and go over and have a listen. But yeah, I'll see you in the next video, guys. Thanks for watching.